welcome everyone to this um, really fun and exciting noon seminar today. We are so lucky to have seven alumni from our master's program tell us what life has been like after they've graduated. So while this seminar is gonna be especially important for our current master's students to hear about how um, these alumni found their jobs, it's also gonna be such a great opportunity for all of us to get a better sense about the various career trajectories that our alumni have taken. And since we are so lucky to have these seven um, alumni joining us, I'm gonna get us started right away. We're gonna hold this session as a panel. So I'm gonna have each of our guest speakers um, each present for about five minutes um, where they're sh they'll share with you about their jobs, their current positions, how they found them. And then after all speakers have finished, we're gonna open it up for some questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it now to Danielle Gaskin, who is a graduate of our program from last year. Um, and she is a senior research program coordinator um, working right now in our department for the Early Childhood Services Research Program. So Danielle, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Kristen. I am really honored to be here with you all. I am so um, thankful I was invited. Um, as Kristen said, my name is Danielle Gaskin, for those who have not met me, and I graduated from the program last year in 2020. Um, I am a senior research program coordinator here in the department with the Early Childhood Services Research Program. I started this job back in July, and I um, heard about this job because I had done some work with Cynthia my first year um, in New, around New Jersey's work. Um, and we touched base after graduation to think about some postgraduate opportunities where I could expand my skills around this systems thinking early childhood services. Um, and so that process took about two months to apply and I interviewed as well. Um, and thank you for the next slide. Um, and I started in July. So the center's work um, supports the development and scale up of stakeholder driven precision early childhood services through innovative methods. And the team has a variety of projects that work across early childhood support services. If you could go back to the earlier slide for me. Thank you. Um, my work focuses on home visiting. Um, so the projects I've worked on are also supported by the Home Visiting Applied Research Collaborative, which is also known as HARC. And HARC is a practice-based research network for conducting collaborative field-driven research around home visiting. And the overarching theme of HARC is precision home visiting, which asks us to consider what home visiting or aspects of home visiting works best for which families, why and how. And so if you go on to the next slide, um, I am sharing two of the projects that I work on primarily and the first of which focuses on this precision home visiting, and that's the cross-model precision prenatal home visiting project. And in this project, we hope to identify the home visiting interventions um, that are used to promote good birth outcomes. And we did this in four ways, and I work primarily on the um, interviews uh, with pregnant people who are currently enrolled in prenatal home visiting. And I um, also helped conduct a um, review of the peer-reviewed literature, home visiting literature, to see what is reported around these interventions. Um, so with the interviews, I was involved in the later development of those interviews, the pilot testing and conducting those interviews. Um, and I also am one of the leads on the coding of those interviews. Um, and then I worked with Paris Lowe to conduct the literature review and the abstraction. If you go on to the next slide, um, I wanna share um, the project that I was um, hired to um, work on primarily, which is the California Home Visiting Coordination Initiative. And on this project, um, we, along with our partners, James Bell Associates and our funder, First Five California, are working with 50 California counties to assess the level of coordination within their counties among home visiting um, programs and between home visiting and other family support services. And we're, um, our goal is to support them in their coordination efforts through technical assistance. Um, and so here at Hopkins, um, we were the leads for the a survey in order to assess the coordination within the counties and also their technical assistance needs. Um, and so I was involved with the development and dissemination of that survey. We're at 90% uh, participation, which is amazing. Um, and also figuring out what the technical assistance needs are. 
And so I also serve as a TA liaison for the Sacramento and Bay Area regions, which is around 14 counties. Um, and we're in the planning phase of the project. So my TA has primarily focused on their development and refinement of their action plans for this project through one-on-one -on -one and regional group format TA. The next slide, please. Um, so really quickly to think about, to reflect on my time at Hopkins as a student um, and how that has served me in my current position, because I'm just one year out, um, is that one, the course content has really provided a great foundation for thinking about these big systems and how they can work coordinated, um, work in a coordinated effort to really serve families with young children and families that are expecting children. Um, and um, I also have a certificate in health disparities. So home visiting has made a effort to really embed equity in their work and also think about ways that they can be more inclusive. So it has been great to really see that course content reflected in this field that I am entering. I was a teaching assistant for four different um, courses. And so I built up a lot of soft skills, um, particularly around providing feedback and communicating with students and with professors that have definitely translated into my work as a TA with these 14 counties in California. Um, and then finally, um, my two practicum opportunities. Um, I worked with the Johns Hopkins WIC program um, on the HPRO project, where I worked closely with the coordinator learning her work and also provided technical assistance to the five WIC agencies who were selected for this grant at a workshop. So working with individuals who are experts in their fields and really just supporting them in the goals that they have outlaid um, with some of the more technical information that we have, um, have in hand. Um, on the My Hospital Experience project, I um, worked on the qualitative analysis and that was my first introduction to qualitative analysis and that served as the basis of my essay. And then this housing project I helped build up from the start. So developing, writing up the IRB, creating the survey interview instruments, development and piloting, and learned a lot of Qualtrics, which is the primary survey platform I've been using for this job. Next slide, please. So um, they asked us what had happened to our master's essay. And mine is in progress for publication. I am in the process. I completely reworked it, um, did some new analyses. So it is in the process of being submitted um, to the journal this week or by the end of next week, which is exciting. And next slide. Um, a huge thank you again. I really look forward to your questions and discussion hearing from my other um, fellow alums who are on the call. Um, and my email is there as well as the websites for HARC as well as the um, Early Childhood Services Research Program um, if you have questions about all the work that we do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. And just to remind you all that for those of you especially that are joining late to just save your questions until the rest of our panelists have um, been done speaking. So thank you, Danielle, so exciting to hear. Now I'm gonna turn it to Grace who is on phone um, Grace Garrell graduated uh, two years ago, and right now she is a program manager working with the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs. So Grace, you can take it away. Thank you. Um, it's really great to hear from you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, and my apologies that I cannot be um, in camera, but I'm currently in rural North Carolina where the bandwidth is, is not good, so um, please bear with me. Um, just to confirm, um, Kristen or anyone else, if you can't hear me well, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, so again, hello, everyone. My name is Grace Guerrero Ramirez. I graduated from the program in 2019, um, and my focal area was in maternal, fetal, and perinatal health. I am a currently a program manager for workforce development and capacity building at the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, um, also known as AMCHIP. Um, so first, I'm going to start with talking a little bit about who AMCHIP is. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I assume that many of you have, have heard about AMCHIP. Um, we have a very essential platform in the MCH world. Um, AMCHIP is a, a national partner, advocate, resource, and convener for MCH populations and leaders. 
And as a membership organization, um, our members mostly consist of leaders in MCH and children and youth with special health care needs programs at the state and territory levels. So our, our umbrella is mainly um, under, falls under Title V funded programs and staff, but we also partner with local entities and, and CBOs as well. And we do a lot. Um, our work really ranges from child and adolescent health to dissemination of evidence-based practices uh, to workforce development and capacity building, which is where I uh, come in. Next slide, please. So uh, broadly, the mission of my team, the Workforce Development and Capacity Building Team, is to ensure that our MCH workforce has the knowledge, tools, skills, and support to most effectively and also equitably lead in MCH. So my work is very cross-cutting. And to give you an idea of what I do in my day-to-day, -day, um, I provide technical assistance to MCH staff, which involves, for example, developing and disseminating resources, uh, coordinating and facilitating leadership and skills development trainings across a range of topics. So that can include, you know, um, what does racially just leadership and MCH look like and how do we get there um, to how can we build effective and diverse interdisciplinary teams. So I see myself as a technical assistance and facilitator specialist. Um, many of our staff um, come to us at AMCHIP with questions around, you know, how can I most equitably and authentically engage community and family members that we're working with? Um, how can I have challenging and difficult conversations with our staff members um, around racial and health equity? I also uh, lead an intensive um, leadership development program called Leadership Lab where I support new MCH Title V directors and staff across roles um, and provide orientation pathways into Title V and skills building opportunities as they embark in their leadership journeys. Um, so this all really requires me to be um, a generalist and really have a bird's eye view of what's happening in MCH in the systems and the workforce. Uh, next slide, please. So how did I get my job? Um, I've been looking into Anchip since grad school. So I, I did my research while I was at school. And this also allowed me to build some relationships in the organization and to really become familiarized with the work that they did. Um, one year after grad school, I saw an opening online for a job position in AMCHIP, and um, I applied for that position, which is a different position from the one I'm in. Um, I went through the initial um, hiring process, but was recommended for my current position based on, on my workforce development background. The whole process took about a month, so relatively quickly. Um, and I've been at AMCHIP for 11 months. So I was hired during the pandemic, which hasn't been um, uh, amazing, but um, the virtual onboarding process has been as best as it can be under the circumstances, really. Um, in terms of Hopkins training and how I carry all that baggage with me, um, this department definitely provided, you know, the MCH foundations that are essential for me to do my job. And that includes courses I took on Title V and MCH legislation, MCH systems, um, critical analysis of issues pertaining to our MCH populations. Um, uh, my field placement with Allison West was also incredibly helpful. 
Um, it focused on qualitative research among home visiting and child welfare staff in Maryland. And this process really strengthened my skills in interviewing and facilitation. Um, facilitation, I do all the time. So having those interpersonal facilitation skills has been central to my role at AMCHIP. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I can share other things, but um, I want to be mindful of time. So um, next slide, please. In this slide, you should uh, see my contact information. I know that we have questions um, during this session, but please feel free to reach out if you want to talk about AMCHIP, MCH, or if you have um, any questions for me. I'd be happy to, to talk with you. Thank you. Grace, thank you so much. And just sorry, we can't see you face to face, but um, we will now go on to Caitlin Murphy. And Caitlin Murphy graduated in 2016, as you see, and she's working with the Prince George's County Health Department. So Caitlin, I'll just let you take over from here. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I, um, as was said, graduated in 2016. Um, and I'm now working as a special assistant to the health officer, Dr. Ernest Carter in uh, Prince George's County. Go to the next slide, please. So I'll give you a little bit of background about um, the health department itself. So um, health officers function as the local arm of the state health department. Um, and so that's where they get their legal authority to do all of the, all of the things we think of as um, government run public health. Um, in Prince George's County, we serve a population of almost 1 million people. Um, it's a my majority minority population, so we're over 60% African American and about a quarter foreign born. So it's a unique population to work with. We are located right on the outskirts of DC and um, we have a range of geographic um, attributes from semi-urban in the inner beltway area all the way down to um, rural in our south county area so it's a very um it's a very diverse county to work in um, the prince george's county health department itself has over 500 employees and it's a mix of state and county employees and our mission similar to um, other county health department missions is to protect the public's health assure availability of and access to quality health care services and um, to promote individual and community responsibility for the prevention of disease, injury, and disability. Um, and some of our largest challenges in Prince George's County include significant income inequality. So we have everything from people living um, significantly under the federal poverty level to people living in huge mansions. Um, and so we deal with also a lot of uh, institutional racism that, um, that creates challenges in the county for things like recruiting enough healthcare providers um, to adequately serve the population. Go to the next slide, please. So this is the organization chart. I, I highlighted where I am. So I'm the box in yellow. I report directly to the health officer um, and provide guidance for the organization structure and our strategic directions. Um, and as you can see, the health department has, we have our arms in everything. Um, we have a behavioral health division, environmental health and disease control, which as you can imagine is pretty interesting right now. Um, family health services, which is our clinical service arm and then health and wellness with, which is our um, health promotion and disease prevention arm. Go to the next slide. So the special assistant role, I put some of my um, tasks here. Essentially what I do is manage special projects for the health officer. Um, we are blessed in Prince George's County to have a health officer who is a true visionary. Um, so he's always coming up with ideas and tasking me with implementation. Um, so it's been it's been a, a little bit of everything and a, and a really great um, a really great journey with the with the health department. Um, I also, just to give you a, a, I'll highlight two other things here and, and you can, you know, read it. Um, but one of the very cool things that I, I like to do is um, administer the Prince George's County Health Assurance Fund, 
which is a um, local fund of county money that the federally qualified health centers can draw down on for uninsured patient visits. And um, we've shown through uh, research that this results in significant reductions in unnecessary emergency room visits and really improves the health of our population. So that's been, that's been a great experience. And actually this year, we were able to grow that fund from $250,000 to $3 million. So we're making significant progress there through um, lobbying our local elected officials. Um, and the other thing that is uh, very unique that I do is um, serve as the legislative liaison for the Maryland General Assembly and the Prince George's County Council. So I'm responsible for reviewing all of the bills introduced at the um, state and county levels and assessing them for health impact. Um, and then I write oral and written testimony and we um, provide our feedback uh, and work with the legislators to improve the bills from a health and equity standpoint. And then I put other duties as a sign because in local health, you never know what's going to pop up. So it, it, it's always interesting. Can you go to the next slide? Um, I wanted to um, share an example project to give you an idea of um, the kinds of things that we work on in local health. So back in April, um, we were not doing well in Prince George's County. We were um, experiencing significantly higher um, uh, infection hospitalization and death in Prince George's County than the rest of the state and actually were named a hotspot by the uh, the White House. So my my boss called me and um, said, Caitlin, I want you to put something together for um, people who are experiencing vulnerabilities during this time and to make sure we don't have this phenomenon of people dying at home, which was something we were seeing um, for folks who were not connected into the healthcare system. And so um, I put together an intervention for residents who were either exposed to or who were COVID-19 positive, which consisted of a team of eight bilingual community health workers um, who did things like connect patients to health insurance at our federally qualified health centers um, to, I'm sorry, health insurance with DSS and then medical care and mental health services at our federally qualified health centers. We also connected to resources for um, food, living situation, and other social determinants of health. And then we home delivered supports for isolation and quarantine, including um, PPE, cleaning supplies, um, other paper goods, educational materials, and a two-week supply of food for those who are food insecure. And actually the health department just um, won the uh, Health Quality Innovator of the Year Award for this project. So um, we're very excited about that. Can you go to the next slide? So to reflect a little bit on my training, um, after graduation in 2016, I worked as an epidemiologist at the Anne Arundel County Department of Health and was there through 2018. Um, just for everyone's awareness, the eligibility for the Epi-1 state classification is it only requires three graduate level Epi courses in addition to some biostats requirements, but the biostats requirements um, will be filled as part of this, this series. So if you're interested, you know, definitely take those three. Um, I came straight from undergrad into grad school. So I found um, in the job hunt afterwards, it was a little bit, um, a, a lot of places wanna see some experience, but this was a great entry level position for me. Um, I started to get really involved with other things going on in the department. So I um, volunteered to help with accreditation and strategic planning and um, really uh, sought out mentorship with the director of the Office of Assessment and Planning who ultimately um, left the department to become a health officer somewhere else, but suggested that I take this or apply for this special assistant role in Prince George's County. So it was through that connection that I learned of the position um, and applied there. And I'll just note that um, county positions tend to pay a little better than state positions, but they can take a lot longer to hire. So from the time I click submit on the application, to um, when I was hired, it was about five months. So a pretty significant period of time. Um, in terms of how my or my um, experience at Hopkins prepared me, I just, I see um, Dr. Gross and Dr. Page um, and um, Dr. Augustine and just wanna thank them so much for um, their, they prepared me much more than I ever realized at the time. 
um, I think really the practicum experience with Johns Hopkins WIC gave me the opportunity to take a small scale intervention, which was the Share Our Strength Cooking Matters program um, from an idea all the way through to the evaluation and um, gave me some real world experience both in doing nutrition education on the ground and speaking with the community, um, but also um, learning the importance firsthand of things like um, making materials culturally competent. Um, we initially tried to implement the same curriculum across our three locations and it just completely fell flat because we had to tailor it um, in order to speak to uh, who we were working with. So that was a great experience and, and I really take the, the skills that I learned in my practicum um, and also in my courses, of course, but but really the practicum gave me the the on the ground, roll up your sleeves and get to work experience that you need to be good in local public health. Go to the next slide, please. So here's my email address and phone number. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And um, this is just my advocacy for local health. I think it's where the magic happens. So please consider uh, applying to jobs at your local health department. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I did get to hear everything that you were speaking about. So, so exciting. I'm gonna now turn it to Meredith um, who graduated in 2018 and she is now a research coordinator with the Gay Men's Health Crisis. So Meredith, welcome. I only have like one slide because I do a lot of workshops and like five minutes goes by really fast. Um, so um, I just kind of wanted to kind of just you know, kind of have just a summary of what my takeaway points are. Um, so again, um, my official title is research coordinator, but I am on the management team. My department is just me and my boss. Uh, so we work, you know, it's we work really closely together. CMHC, it's, it's located in New York City. It was the world's first HIV AIDS service organization founded in 1981, so right around when the epidemic started by the late Larry Kramer and five other men. So they do direct services, they do advocacy. I'm in the research and technical assistance department. Uh, my boss and I work on a cohort study uh, with several sites across the country. Um, it's called the Research on Older Adults uh, with HIV, aka ROA study. Uh, we, in terms of the re most recent thing that we are doing with that, we just submitted revisions, as many of you know, uh, that is often the process of publishing. You submit your paper, they ask for revisions before they'll publish it or consider publishing it. Um, and ours is about how COVID-19 has impacted um, older adults with HIV. Um, I also manage um, the National Resource Center for HIV and Aging website, um, just relaunched it. And I also do, um, a lot of trainings and webinar content around how to um, support um, people aging with HIV as well. So I would say that um, my public health training definitely prepared me well, um, you know, in terms of skills around kind of um, health communications and health research. Um, I was really lucky in that I uh, was, um, given a fellowship position at the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities through Kennedy Krieger. Um, I did some research that resulted in a conference presentation. Their whole goal with me for the fellowship was to, you know, put research together and then submit it for a particular conference. I then got funding from them to write my master's essay, which was about um, mental health among um, LGBTQ plus autistic adults. I'm on the spectrum myself and we're more likely to identify as LGB and or T. That is the case with me. Um, and, you know, it really was um, an opportunity to really kind of do research on my own and to design it myself. I certainly did not start collecting the data on my own, but continuing to collaborate with data collection and um, certainly I worked with my committee, but you know, really kind of getting that hands-on experience um, was certainly key in helping me land this job. And uh, how did I get this job? It was a very long, you know, kind of winded 
journey. So um, the fall after I graduated, I got what I thought was my dream job at the New York City Department of Health. And I, I was still living in Baltimore. I was working part-time for um, my former advisor at the Gates Institute, Dr. Amy Choi, who just retired. And um, so I was still living in Baltimore, but I had signed, you know, I just signed a lease for an apartment in New York. And a couple hours after I did that, I got a phone call that there were some budget cuts. And so I actually decided I was going to move to New York City anyway. Professor Choi let me work at Gates remotely, but I had to work two other part-time jobs to kind of stay afloat in addition to continuing this job search. One of those jobs was at an LGBTQ service delivery organization, um, and I thought that I could get my foot in the door that way, but it was a toxic environment to work at, and the staff people didn't like that I let them know that I thought it was a toxic work environment. Um, I also, I'm going to be real, I think that disability discrimination 100% had to do with it. I didn't tell people I was autistic, but people saw my research and I think put two and two together. Unfortunately, you know, people with disabilities, we're, you know, especially people with developmental disabilities like myself, like we're seen as kind of, you know, a token hire, but we're not seen as people who can really kind of be in more senior, more leadership positions. But after about a year of struggling, um, GMHC um, contacted me. I actually applied for another job there a few months ago, and I was their number two pick. Um, but you know, even though they said, we'll keep your resume on file, I didn't really believe them that this was going to really lead anywhere. But again, a few months later, they called me and said, we have this other position. Would you like to, um, to take this job? Um, and of course they said yes. And I had heard about the first job at GMHC that I applied to where um, in the interview process, even though I didn't get that job, I made that good first impression. I got it um, because I, um, I met someone who became a professional contact of mine at a conference that I you know, got, um, I had won that JHSPH conference funding lottery to attend, even though um, that presentation I submitted, I, um, it was not accepted for that conference. And so that really brings me to kind of this iceberg illusion graphic that I have here. I mean, pop fam, like I'm flattered that they asked me to speak, like they probably did because they think, you know, that I am successful to some degree. And I, I totally see what they mean. But a lot of what people don't see is all the things that are below this iceberg, so to speak. I mean, I had, I mean, I just told you about how during grad school, like funding opportunities and whatnot just fell into my lap. I took four years between grad and undergrad. Not that I, not that I got any, not that I got every job that came my way, but I didn't have to work as hard as I did to get this job that I have now at GMHC. And I think it's really important to normalize that rejection. I mean, my friends and I like will post about not just the fellowships and the conference proposals and the funding that we get, but also that we didn't get. And like, I would imagine that all the pop band professors here and other folks on this panel probably also have many, many stories of failures of things that didn't pan out, that they got rejected from. Um, and so the moral of the story I would say is that right now in the pandemic, there's this idea that like mutual aid is important. That really applies to kind of helping each other out um, speaking to current students specifically um, in, you know, kind of helping each other find, you know, jobs and other contacts and whatnot. Um, and, you know, you can friend me on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to reach out to me and talk further, um, you know, please do. My email is listed there. Um, but yeah, like I really, um, I really just kind of wanted to, to, to really kind of send the message to, you know, current students that, you know, like, you probably won't succeed all the time. I mean, that's just life. And that was a hard lesson that I had to learn in these three years since I've graduated. Um, but there are people out there who will support you and you definitely are capable because you're graduating from the top public health school in the country. Thank you, Meredith, so much for that real talk. I love that. And I think it's a, a, a just as equally important message as, as how you got a job. And yes, 
we are all have faced a large number of failures out there. So it's how you move from that um, is really important. So thank you so much. So I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Claire Silberg, who is a recent graduate. She just graduated last year and is now back with us working with the Gates Institute. So Claire, I will um, let you take it over from here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Kristen. Um, so I have put together a few brief slides. Uh, Dina, if you wanna go to the next slide, we can get started. Perfect. Um, so I work as a research program officer with the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I have been in this position for around two months, so I am still relatively new. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the Institute, though, uh, the, the Gates Institute conducts research globally um, in the areas of family planning, uh, sexual reproductive health, and population dynamics mainly. Um, and we also do a lot of work related to building technical capacity and facilitating knowledge exchange in these key focal areas. So I work on the PMA project, um, which stands for Performance Monitoring for Action. And what we do is implement uh, high quality cross-sectional um, and longitudinal surveys in nine countries globally um, in order to monitor family planning and development indicators, both nationally and subnationally in these countries. Um, what makes PMA unique is the fact that we collect data at both the, the, household, the household level um, as well as the healthcare level or the facilities level, um, which really helps us see uh, the, the a holistic family planning landscape um, with our data that we collect. Um, we also collect data that is not currently being measured by other large scale surveys. Um, and the, the study design itself really allows us to evaluate contraceptive use dynamics and contraceptive trends over time. Um, we work really closely with uh, local universities and research institutions in these partner countries um, who help us with the development and implementation of the survey. Um, and we also help countries develop policies and programming related to family planning um, by disseminating our results after data collection is completed and the data is analyzed. Um, so next slide. Thank you. Uh, okay, so kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, I, I want to take a moment to talk about the job searching process and what that was like during the pandemic. Um, when preparing this presentation, I was trying to think about what would be most helpful for the current master's students who are about to graduate and enter a similar um, job hunting environment that I was in a year ago. Uh, so for the sake of transparency, I have created um, a job searching chart to show my job hunting experience. Um, I thought it'd be useful to showcase kind of both the realities of job hunting, given the, you know, the tough environment that we're in right now. Um, and I think it's also really important to acknowledge the fact that this is a competitive field, um, particularly global public health is a really competitive place to be in and knowing some of the realities of what to expect with the job hunt ahead of time um, and mentally preparing for the job hunt, I, I hope could benefit you. Um, and this is just my own personal experience. Uh, this is the experience of everyone, but um, you know, normalizing rejection, I really liked what Meredith said. So I thought I would showcase that with this diagram. Um, so I started seriously searching for jobs in late August of this past year um, after I wrapped up another project I was working on. Uh, the application process was very similar for almost all jobs. Um, I found jobs online and I applied via online portal. Um, all of my interviews were conducted virtually. Uh, for some positions, a skills assessment was involved, which essentially consisted of a, a take home assignment or um, kind of like a homework assignment. Um, in terms of the timeline, between the first application to the first job offer, it was around six months. Um, and I started my job virtually about a month after my offer was given. Um, so as you can see, um, Sorry, can you hear me? I think I was muted for a second. 
Yep, yes, you're good. We're okay, good. perfect. Um, so as you can kind of see quite clearly through the diagram, um, there were a lot of rejections and no responses along the way, which was which was really difficult. Um, you no, know, out of the 21 jobs I applied to, I did not hear back from nine of them. Um, I got six rejection emails right away. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to have six um, invitations to interview. Um, there are definitely moments during this process though where I really began questioning myself and my abilities. Um, but what I learned through this process is to, to you know, trust the process. I know this is gonna sound a little bit like a cliche, but really to trust the process and be patient with it. Um, you don't want to rush into a position that you don't want to be in and one in which you feel doesn't align with what you want to be doing. Um, so I would say to really be intentional with where you apply even in moments of impatience and frustration that may arise during the job hunting process. Um, I would encourage you now to, uh, now that you are almost finished with the master's program, to reflect on what skills you hope to gain and grow during your first few years after the master's program has ended. Um, once you've kind of identified the skills you want to gain, look for environments where you want to uh, foster those skills and where you want to grow those skills in. You know, and, and make sure that the opportunities you seek out now align with who you want to be um, and what you want to be doing in the future. Um, so next slide. So speaking about uh, skills, um, my, my training with PopFam really directly prepared me for my role with the Gates Institute. Uh, for example, a big part of my day to day job is overseeing data management activities in two countries um, and I use data almost every single day at my job. Um, similarly, my foundational knowledge in family planning research and family planning programming and global trends has allowed me to succeed in this role. Um, I have listed here just a handful of classes that I took during the program, the MSPH program, which directly helped me um, in my job today um, and classes in which I'm kind of drawing from on a consistent basis. Um, beyond the coursework as well, working with faculty members during the MSPH program and having the opportunity to do my practicum abroad in Kenya were both really vital in helping um, prepare me to work in the job environment in which I'm at now. Um, the PMA project operates almost like a startup environment. Um, the project is kind of continually evolving and being able to pivot quick, quickly and critically analyze and problem solve fast and um, evolve with the project is really important. Uh, I don't think I would be able to do so successfully without having had the direct experience of working abroad during my practicum um, and working with different research teams here at Hopkins. So I am constantly applying what I've learned in my job, both hard and soft skills. And I'm continuing to learn still at my job today. I'm augmenting the foundational knowledge I gained during the master's program um, at my current position, which is great. Um, okay, next slide. So I want to just say thank you to Kristen and Dina for inviting me to speak today. Uh, and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about navigating the post MSPH world. It can be tough out there. Um, and I just want to let you know I'm, I'm open. If you ever wanna reach out via LinkedIn or email me, I'm happy to, to talk with you. So thank you. Thanks, Claire. And also really appreciate that um, flow chart that you provided. I thought that was really valuable. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to Brianna, who also is a recent graduate, and she is currently the deputy director, as you can see, with Queen's Comprehensive Perinatal Council. So welcome, Brianna. Welcome back, I should say. Yes, hi, Christian. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Brianna Watson, and I graduated last year. My focal area was maternal, fetal, and perinatal health, and I do currently work as the deputy director at the Queen's Comprehensive Perinatal Council. Um, all right, so to start, I'll talk a little bit about the organization I work for. Um, we're commonly referred to as QCPC. Our name is pretty long, so we do go by that often. Um, and we are a maternal uh, ch and child nonprofit community-based organization. So we do work on the very um, 
let's see, like grassroots type of community level. And it's absolutely amazing. I love it. But anyway, um, so our mission is to improve the health status of women, infants, children, and adolescents. Um, and QCPC has been doing this since 1988. We typically provide uh, case management services, consumer provider education, uh, social services, client advocacy, and just so much more. Our current main initiative is the Teen Support Project, um, and it's a holistic program that's designed to empower pregnant and parenting adolescents in our catchment area. Um, and we help them to accomplish their reproductive goals, academic, training, workforce goals. Um, and our goals as an organization are to help our teen moms avoid a rapid repeat pregnancy. Um, so it is true that um, many adolescents who have given birth the first time, um, they may, they are at increasingly increased risk of having um, a second pregnancy within a two-year period. And that's something that um, comes with its own a slew of increased morbidities. Um, and so we do at we do work at QCPC that helps our teen moms to avoid that. Um, this project is federally funded. It's funded by the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, specifically in the Office of Population Affairs. And we were one of the very few projects that were funded for secondary teen pregnancy. And so that's just something we're very, very proud of. Um, and at the bottom there is our logo and mission statement. Next slide, please. Great. Alrighty. Um, so like Claire, I do also have this sort of roadmap of getting my job. Um, I do want to be very transparent. Um, and so this sort of just outlines that. So um, this map starts at my graduation, um, but I should let you know I was applying for jobs even before I graduated. Um, I was a little bit impatient and a little bit worried as well. Um, but yeah, so I spent about six months after graduation just scanning every job board that I could think of. I did have a very broad um, application process. So I applied um, for a lot of job listings, especially in New York City. The, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was just my dream job. That's where I wanted to be. Um, and it was just so funny because I was applying at the beginning of the pandemic. And sometimes, you know, I'd apply and they'd say, oh, this is great. And you know, we want you to come in for an interview. And then they'd call me a little while later and say, well, actually our department's in lockdown. So the job you were even applying for just literally doesn't exist anymore. So there was a lot of that that was going on. Um, but anyway, in the meantime of the six months, I was also um, working on certifications. And so I was boosting my knowledge um, and also boosting how my resume would look to potential employers. So, um, I earned my um, certified health education specialist and certified lactation counselor certifications. And that really boosted my love for the community level. So now that really honed in where I wanted to be and who I wanted to work for. So my search narrowed down and I knew I was looking for something on the community level. So I was finally selected for an interview sometime in October. Um, and it was a pretty rigorous um, interview process. I had to write interview, um, I had to write essays about different managing strategies um, and things of that nature. And I was then selected for a second interview with the executive director of QCPC. And um, then finally I was hired. Next slide, please. Great, so um, this is just a little bit more about what I do. Um, so this is sometimes day to day um, and sporadic. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll just start with my main responsibility, which is managing the teen support project initiative. So I make sure all the place all the pieces are fitting together um, and that we're meeting with our objectives in a timely manner and that all the general responsibilities that come with managing a project in a community based setting um, are being met. Um, I also supervise our staff that work to accomplish the successful implementation of the project objectives in their direct interaction with our clients. Um, so I supervise um, our maternal and child health program coordinator, our senior case coordinators as well, and I assist them and provide technical assistance in that way and supervision in general as well. 
Um, partnerships, I do foster, maintain, and sometimes create new community partnerships that contribute to our successes. And working for a community-based organization, this also contributes to our sustainability. So this is a really important um, and arguably one of my favorite parts because it allows me to meet with other people who and other teams and other community-based organizations that are passionate about the same, um, the same issues um, and public health concerns that exist in our community. And so it's always great meeting with um, like-minded people. Um, data compliance is another large part of what I do. Um, I manage it and I make sure that um, all of our data is in compliance with um, our federal grant. We do need to meet the parameters of our grant as far as data collection and reporting. So we have independent evaluators that we report to on a monthly basis. And so I'm a part of making sure that all of that process goes smoothly. I do some marketing as well in the sense that I champion our teen support project initiative to our stakeholders. Um, and that includes our community's reproductive health care providers, our elected officials that are um, involved regionally in our um, other health initiatives with our partnering agencies um, as well. Um, and I am typically the person who represents QCPC at community and industry events, um, health fairs and things like that, which is great because I love talking about us and I love what I'm doing. So that's um, also one of my favorite parts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yes, um, Hopkins training definitely contributed to my ability to get the job that I have. On the left, I do have some classes that especially stuck out to me and that are related to the work that I do now, um, but this is a very short list. There were really so many um, classes at Hopkins that there are direct parallels to the work that I am doing. Um, and I have to praise and thank my advisor, Dr. Pam Donahue, who I think is on the call today. Hi, Pam. Um, and she just went above and beyond to support me in my academic and professional journey. I literally don't know what I would have done without her support. And so she's just a gem and, and, and really gave me that whole positive um, memory of my time at Hopkins. And of course, my field work placement was excellent. I did work with my advisor as well there and also Dr. Seltzer, both of whom just taught me so much. And my field work placement was at the John Hopkins School of Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, I worked as a research study coordinator there um, and it really developed my skills working with um, and collecting and analyzing data. And so that's contributed to the work that I do at QCPC. Um, as well. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. All right. Um, so a big thank you for inviting me to speak here. This was um, such a pleasure and it was so great hearing um, my colleagues' experiences as well. This is my contact information um, for anyone who wants to reach me. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brianna. Really appreciate it. And now we have our last speaker, Betsy Weand. And I would just remind folks because the time, if you wanna start writing your questions down in the chat, please feel free so. Free, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much. And Betsy, I will let you take over. Great, well, thanks so much. I'm really happy that you all invited me to here to speak today. Um, before I jump into my remarks, I just need to add a little disclaimer that I am speaking on my own behalf, not on the behalf of the federal government, including the Department of Health and Human Services or the Health Resources and Services Administration where I work. So next slide. So background on me and what I do, I am currently a health insurance specialist within the Office of Provider Support at the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, the Office of Provider Support is a brand new office. We were created in response to the pandemic and our sole purpose is uh, to push out funding to uh, various types of healthcare providers to help stabilize the healthcare system uh, because of the revenue losses and um, increased expenses related to responding to the pandemic. And we also oversee a program called the COVID-19 Claims Reimbursement uh, for Healthcare Providers facility and Facilities for Testing, Treatment, and Vaccine Administration for the Uninsured. As you probably know, we have a lot of uninsured 
folks in this country and we want to make sure that out-of-pocket costs are not a barrier to care. So we provide claims reimbursement in um, for providers who deliver these services and would otherwise end up billing the patients and or not getting uh, any money for these services. Um, so taking a step back, the Office of Provider Support is within the Health Resources and Services Administration. And I've heard a number of folks talk about programs that we either interact with or oversee. Um, so HRSA is the primary federal agency for improving health uh, for various vulnerable populations. And we uh, work with Title V in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. We uh, have the HIV AIDS Bureau that oversees the Ryan White program. Uh, we also have the Bureau of Primary Health Care, which oversees federally qualified health centers. Uh, so we, we touch on a number of programs. We are primarily a grant making agency. Um, and normally our budget is around $12.1 billion, anywhere from 11 to 15. However, with the Provider Relief Fund, we've added $186.5 billion to our uh, overall budget. So um, that's why we needed a whole brand new office to uh, set up distribution of these funds. Um, so my role within that office is to help with policy making. That can include putting out and developing policy guidance. Uh, we largely govern our program through frequently asked questions, which I think if we had more time to uh, administer the program, we might not have uh, chosen FAQs as a way to govern the program, but because we were moving so rapidly in the early months of the pandemic, that is largely how we put information out to our stakeholders. Um, another uh, key part of my role is identifying where we need policy decisions. Um, so we're in an interesting time right now because we are still in the midst of transition between administrations. Um, so we had been working very closely with folks at the department level and trying to and trying to implement the program in partnership with policy officials down there. Um, we are now kind of in a holding pattern with some of our uh, decisions that we need to keep rolling out more funding. Um, and so it's trying to figure out what will resonate now with the Biden administration that probably wouldn't have resonated with the Trump administration and making sure that we are pivoting appropriately to meet the overall goals of uh, this new administration with the remaining funds that we have left. Um, and that can be taken in the form of developing decision memos to help guide our leadership or putting together lots of pretty PowerPoints um, to try and facilitate getting decisions. Um, so next slide. Um, I just want to quick touch on the hiring process. So in my current role, I was pulled out of my previous office. Uh, and originally it was supposed to be a temporary assignment, but I decided that this work seemed interesting. So I decided to raise my hand and said, I will be a permanent member of this new office. Um, but in my previous role at HRSA, uh, I went through the standard process of applying through USA Jobs, and um, it was actually a really quick process by federal government standards. I applied in August, I got an interview in November, and I got an informal offer by early December. Um, that it was somewhat unusual. I have been told that my resume was way shorter than it needs to be in the federal government. Um, and I only had one interview um, before I received an offer. Um, so I'm not sure that there are necessarily lessons to be learned that are broadly applicable other than it doesn't always look the same across agencies and departments within the federal government. Um, and then we can move to the next slide. Um, 
I, because I'm one of the older folks on this panel, um, I've drawn upon the skills I developed at Hopkins. Um, two of the ones that jumped immediately to mind is that I, in Don Strabino's class, learned how to critique the research literature. And I have used that in a number of positions. And I also really was able to develop my technical writing skills. Uh, and that has been very helpful across positions. Um, previous to my time at HRSA, I was with the American College of OBGYNs doing a lot of policy work there. And um, I used a lot of the clinical and epi information um, in my day-to-day -day work. Um, and then one thing that I was thinking about as I was putting this together is understanding demography has influenced a lot of the uh, policy making and policy choices um, that I have pulled together and is not something that I see in a lot of my colleagues, that that is something unique and valuable from the pop fam department that has been influential uh, when doing my job. Um, so I will close there because I know I'm past my five minutes um, and just say thank you for inviting me. And I appreciate uh, this panel because it's coming somewhat full circle. I did a um, informational interview with Meredith before she came to Hopkins. And so I feel like uh, this is really a great panel and group of folks to be with. Thank yes, I remember so that. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well, we don't have enough, a lot of time. So I just, I, I've asked some folks to write questions, but um, I think what we can just do is students, especially if any of you have any questions right now, we just have a t enough time for like maybe one or two questions, but you have a, hopefully everyone's email um, addresses so that you can reach out to them after this. But can I take anyone's questions right now? I was curious if, if I if I may. Uh, I was curious if uh, any of our uh, graduates who are working in government uh, positions discern any gaps in their uh, policy, economic, or political background necessary to cope with the variety of issues they face, and what can we do about it? If so. I'll let any one of our panelists um, go first. I, I can jump in on that one. I will say from my personal experience, I probably would have benefited from taking some economics classes. And every once in a while, when I toy with the idea of getting a doctorate, I think strongly about uh, going into health economics. Um, but I think overall, um, in part because I, um, like Brianna, had a very scattershot uh, job interview or job selection process when I first got out of grad school. I didn't know that I was going to go into policy, so it was hard for me to uh, identify those gaps at the outset of my uh, job search. Thank you. I can speak a little bit about that. I think um, one great thing that Hopkins did was really show the global landscape. Um, and so I learned a lot about that, but I, but I don't think I knew necessarily as much about how policy and um, just uh, health law in general works at the state level. Um, which I understand, you know, it's different from state to state, so it might not be helpful to, to really learn that, but I, I, it was a big learning curve starting in local health to figure out um, even like what environmental health means at the local level, you know, it's like perk testing and putting sewers in, which is very different than, you know, the global things that we were learning, so that, that would be my feedback. Interesting, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Caitlin. Good to see you too. I want to thank all of you. Um, this was just really informative and fun to kind of hear what you all have been up to. Um, it's it's just such a great um, welcoming back just to see your faces. Um, 
And I want you to all continue to stay in touch. And especially, um, I wanna just welcome all the students, especially those of you that are graduating soon, um, feel free to reach out to these great resources. Um, that's why we invited them. So um, anyways, really appreciate everyone's participation today. And until next time, um, we shall see you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Thanks you. For this together and inviting me to speak. Great to see you. And everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.